two, one. Ben Herring, welcome to the podcast, mate. Great to see your face on screen. Pleasure to be here, Brandy. Thanks for having me. <laughs> really looking forward to this chat. We um, we caught up a week or two ago to, to discuss, discuss a few other things, and um, which we'll talk about in this podcast. But um, I'm really excited to, to pick your brains and get into some of the stuff you've been doing. So but firstly, Japan life. You've had a coffee this morning. How's it all going and what's the current state? It's Mate, the season is well and truly in. We're actually in, into our last, the top league here. It's the last round of the, before we get into knockout stages. It's uh, it's an exciting comp. It's a lovely competition, actually. Um, COVID situations cancelled a couple of games, delayed the season by four weeks, but it's gone ahead pretty good. And yeah, uh, everyone's enjoying the rugby. It's some fantastic rugby being played. Awesome. And a, a small overview of who you're coaching, how it's going, what's the what's the vibe at the moment? I'm coaching a team called the Hino Red Dolphins, who are newly promoted to the top league. And uh, we, we're in the, the process of getting better, mate. We're um, <laughs> the, the, the newest team. So we, we had a win uh, a couple of weeks ago and we lost by one point against the, the team uh, after that. And that's actually... The progression we're making is very good. There was expectations we wouldn't do particularly well, but uh, we're, we're getting better every week and and getting stronger and, and getting used to what a, a top league competition is. So it's 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 been positive. I'm going to jump straight on a question on that. What is one thing that's been pleasing for you? you you're saying you're getting better. What's an example of you guys getting better? What could you pinpoint? Uh, for me, it's our um, it's our local Japanese. Uh, players that have come through the university system and they're they're just sponges of information and they, and they love it and they love the detail they love getting better and we've managed to have, have real success with a couple of those those Japanese guys that have mixed in with some of the experienced pros and have actually come through the other side better rugby players they're loving it they're confident they're playing with a bit of um, passion and um, confidence really and just seeing those guys that perhaps wouldn't have been uh, confident top league players actually have a bit of puff in their chest and uh, and compete with, you know, all blacks and, and super rugby players and, and hold their own has, has been hugely successful and, and we take a lot of pride in that. I suppose that, that is one thing, right? You, you get these superstar players coming over to play in the comp and in the mindset of the local players. How have you gone about getting them confidence and how you guys can match it with these, you know, people that have dominated um, international games. How have you gone about that? Well, we've taken the approach that we, um, we, we know what we are. We know where we are, where we are at the moment. And with the reality is we're, we're brand new. So let's not grill players for, uh, you know, mm. not, you know, not being able to compete at Bowdoin Barrett's level for example, and we take those, we just try and instill that confidence that we're trying to win every game, but winning is not the result. Winning is the small increments of getting better against yourself. And we've really driven that at training, like you're competing against yourself, just a little bit, one percent is all the time. And it's it's more so about the confidence. Like if, if someone missed a tackle, but less than the week before, that's a massive upper. And just <laughs> to keep that, uh, instilling that kind of um, progression, has been really successful for us. And perhaps that's not what a lot of, um, dare I say, the, the university coaching that Japanese players get here is not that. Uh, it's very much, <laughs> you, you don't win, big trouble. So yeah. to have um, to have something a little bit different, I think has been quirky and unusual. And it's, um, I think it's gone relatively well. I'm sure the boys are enjoying a little bit of your compassion when it comes to, to coaching. So <laughs> good work, mate. Um, Thanks, mate. One of the reasons we, we, we caught up a week or two ago was to talk about Revolution Rugby. It's a product that you've put together, um, targeted at, at, I suppose, organizations and coaches developing the soft skills of, of rugby coaching, a couple of the areas, so process, culture, structure, and leadership. We're going to get into that, but I know that you've got some huge knowledge and experience in coaching around uh, tackle and jackal. 
yourself as a flanker, as a, as a player. So I want to get into that <laughs> straight away. Personal experience, we're down at the Otago gym. Um, you turn up, this guy who loves defense, loves tackling, loves drills, the Swiss balls, bands, tackle pads. We're just doing all this new stuff. Um, when you were a player playing you know, at the high level that you did, did you love the detail then or did that come afterwards? Yeah, good question, Brittany. I did like the detail, but it wasn't the detail of the tackle. It was the detail of what I needed to do um, to, to be as good as I could be. Uh, I was only a little fella. Like when I started playing professionally, I was 85 kilos dripping wet wow. and managed to squeak up to just nudge on 100 at the very, you know, the very peak. But um, always the smallest in the team. So, um you had to always come up with ways. If you're the smallest um, by a long way, you have to come up with other ways to be effective against bigger, better, stronger, faster people. So it was always my, I always enjoyed the challenge that want to run at me because I was clearly smaller. So to try to work that into an advantage was something I really enjoyed. Like, how am I going to get this guy down quickly? You know, he's bigger, stronger. And techniques around that, mm. I really enjoyed. So I didn't know it then, but it, it, that sort of stuff, my sort of, you know, just my sort of selfish, narrow focus on how I can get a bigger, stronger guy down quick um, and then get the ball off him. That, that, that was my intrinsic motivation. And as it's flowed on, I've been able to uh, um, use that kind of attitude of, right, this is what, what I am and what I've got. How can I tweak this to my advantage and make it my own and make it me, me stand out yeah. was something which I've taken to my coaching and around trying to adapt techniques not just your standard bog standard ones, but yeah, I make an individual um, mm. to personalize it and, and do a lot of different drills. And some guys enjoy some drills and not others. Let's focus on those and get good at those and, mm. and make those work. I know that there'll be listeners that are either a small player or coaching small players that have confidence issues. Um, obviously yourself playing in super rugby in New Zealand, you come up against some pretty, pretty big boys and big bodies what were some of the tactics as a smaller body someone's running at you what were some of the things you did or learned to do to create angles and, and make tackles um i guess from a technical point of view in, in the tackle um i have this belief that you got to hit hard whether that's high low wherever you got to create uh, the impact um and how you do that is you know you, you got to get up in someone's face and all that stuff the moment you hit, you're, as soon as you hit, you've got a, a split second then to decide how things happen from there. Either you're gonna, you've won the hit, you felt it, and you go, oh, I've won that. Just my body position was good, my angle, my, my drive. So in that second, then you work out what you do if you win that hit, hmm. which is you know you drive forward, grips, twist, finish on top, all that stuff. But the other aspect is for a smaller person is, a good chunk of the time when you get that hit, you'll realize straight away, I'm not going to win this. Um, physics, <laughs> momentum, I'm not going to win this battle. Yeah. So that's the other half of it. And for a smaller guy, it's probably going to happen 70% of the time. If you're a bigger guy, maybe it's only going to happen 40% of the time. But working on that, so right, 70% of the time I've got the hit and I'm losing. So then how do you use that, that momentum, that body weight, that losing to trick the person into doing something that you want them to do? Yeah. So it's very judo-ish, you know, like I've hit, they can feel they're going to win. So they're going to keep trying to dominate. If I can then use my body weight as a tripper and, and use him to fall quickly or her to fall quickly, those techniques, those sort of judo-ish techniques, but um, it all comes down to, you've got to actually get a hit to actually know whether you're going to go dominant or, or, or flip them passively. Uh, for me, that yeah. was really important. And I think it's a really good, um, simple philosophy get a good hit and then see what you have to do next and then practice those skill sets 100 percent. do you think as a whole we're, we're practicing those skill sets enough i think about we put a tackle bag in the middle of the field we, we almost sort of co coach one tackle a dominant hit get off the line smash a tackle bag they go backwards you go forwards do you, do you think we we need to start coaching this stuff earlier in the piece to, to younger players yeah, I, I like. I think it is. I think one way tackling. There's so much variety, isn't there, Brainy? Mm. So to just mm. do one way is 
yeah, you're going to miss a lot of tackle tackles if you just try in one way. We certainly know here in Japan, for example, there's uh, traditionally the tackle has been taught 1980s style, just dive at ankles, and that's yeah. the style. So um, <laughs> it it does it, it it does work now and then. It, it, sometimes it can be fantastic, but a, a massive chunk of time, players are getting the heads on the wrong sides, they're getting knocked in the head, they're diving in a, any sort of footwork, and you miss. Mm. Um, so training like a, a, a sort of more techniques and a bigger bigger variety is, is kind of good, I think. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Well, I think of it like kicking, right? You got box kick, goal kick, drop kick, grubber kick, punt kick, but then we just yeah. say t- tackle. Like, yeah. why, why can't we have different styles of tackles and have a, you know, coach and here's, here's a low chop, here's a higher hit, here's a dominant hit. Um, yeah, I, I think we can start that conversation a lot a lot earlier. I, I think it's also really noticeable too, um, Brenny, that as soon as fatigue is entered into a, um, an equation, particularly with the tackle, all techniques tends to go out the window. You can practice on a tackle bag on the line, go hit, wait to the back of the line, do it again. But when you've got 40 seconds of um, lactic acid build up in your legs, um, <laughs> yeah. it sort of uh, it, it tweaks your thinking. Um, I want to ask one more question about tackling. You, you're coaching a team who you've said, you know, they're, they're improving. What's in the area on defence where you guys are trying to get a little win across the park or, or, if, or if current focus at the moment? Yeah. Um, well, that certainly in Japan, our, my, my biggest um, criteria when I started was getting out of the um, default pattern of going at ankles, diving off feet on ankles, dropping your knees to the ground. Um, that was twofold. Uh, firstly, a lot of guys getting knocks in the head. Um, oh. Like they, they couldn't, once you put your knees on the ground, once you dive uh, head first, any sort of movement by opposition player was getting guys whacked in the head. And it's not good for heads. It's not good for people's long term. It's not good for health. <laughs> so that was the, the, the big driver. The second driver, as soon as you dive, you're committed. And we're coming up with uh, it's Japan is a very fast, high stepping game. The amount of missed tackles you get when you go off your feet is is a really high percentage, um, and it leads to a lot of reaching with arms. So not only were we getting hit in the head, we were getting um, we we're missing a lot of tackles and tackles you shouldn't miss, sort of yeah. front on tackles. So uh, that that's been our big focus is to to go a bit higher, which is a sort of unusual sort of concept, but it's it's. The landscape where we've got here is trying to detrain the automatic function of just diving at ankles. Yep. We've we've gone the polar opposite. We say let's try hit around the nipples, and what we're trying to do just by teaching up here, when the the fatigue of the game that comes, that'll sort of branch down about to where we want it, which is a bit more around navelish area. But so yeah. we're training go go higher stick. We're trying to make that more automatic getting off people off knees yeah. um, what it means is players are staying on their feet longer they're keeping their heads up longer um, and it's actually been better for us we have had far fewer head knocks than we had at the start of the season and we're missing far fewer tackles and it's actually um, it's actually easy for us to train because we've got an added disadvantage we have an astroturf um, training facility so Right. By training high, we're not actually going off our feet. So players aren't worried about skinning knees and hitting the deck, which is a big driver for not wanting to make live tackles. But when we're going here and just practicing the hit and stick, we can actually get lots of repetition under fatigue. Like yep. do one, back it up, do another one, back it up, do another one, back it up. And no one minds particularly because you're not hitting a hard deck, you're not skinning your knees, and it's, it's, it's easier to get a lot of repetition. Which, so that's been a big success for us. Mate, there's some, there's some gold in that. The first thing that I could hear when you started talking about the the nipple target, have you had any issues with height? No, we no we don't because, and this is pure speculation, Brenny, but because <laughs> the, the inherent nature is so low and yes, we're right. training here, it feels like under fatigue and the things of a game, it comes back to sort of a, a nice equilibrium, which is in the middle. Yeah. Um, it, that's what it feels like anyway. So we're training 
here. That's where we're anchoring. And this is where we were. And we're finding a, in the games, we're finding sort of a nice, nice middle point. Um, yeah. We're taking it to one extreme, knowing that it'll naturally come back under the normal, you know, stresses of a game. Yeah. So we haven't had any, cool, any any uh, any issues with uh, high tackles. In the next part of the game, I want to a touch on is, is jackal work. When you played, obviously you could make a tackle, stay in there, and just pop back to your feet and, and get your, get your turnover. Um, things have changed a little bit since then. You, you came into, like I said, the, the target gym. You had um, people doing Swiss ball drills and rolling around and, and getting to their feet in unique ways. Um, you, you still put a lot of emphasis on that across the board with, with players. Um. It, not not um, with all players, Brainy. I, I don't think um, putting your head over the ball and waiting to get hit is everyone's cup of tea. Um, yeah, I agree. <laughs> there's, there's, <laughs> there's, de- <laughs> there's definitely a mindset of people that love it and want to get better. So those are the people that um, I enjoy working with. I think trying to train people that aren't big on getting there, um, you know, guys like yourself probably, like um, you, you, the, your expertise is not not – that area and, and largely you don't want your your tens who are controlling games to be stuck at the bottom of dark places you want those guys up looking controlling you know organizing that sort of thing so i think the first thing is if people love it and want to get better they're the people you work with because they've got the they've got the intrinsic motivation to do it well and get better um trying to change someone's psyche from not wanting to do it to do it is is quite a big ask and then yeah. for them to do it well is that you know another step on top. So I know there's the concept of get everyone's skill sets good, but for most teams, not at the highest level, uh, I think it's it's bigger bang for your buck to get the, the people that want to do it better rather than trying to get those that don't want to do it to actually do it in the first place is yeah. is better bang for your buck. So at the moment, we're playing a game. A tackle's happened right in front of me where I can go in and have a crack at a jackal. What are some of the, the tips or advice you're giving or, or things you're seeing players often get wrong or going off their feet or just not staying in the fight to, to win that turnover? Yeah, I think... Um... The, the decisions you, what you make need to be, in terms of getting the ball, need to be automatic. If you have to think about what you have to do, um, you're probably not going to get it. Mm. So getting that instinctiveness to see the picture, which is someone falling, and it's like, I guess the image is like a tree falling. Um, and if if you can get players knowing that they're, they're racing towards where the tree is going to fall is, mm. is quite a nice analogy. So you see someone falling in a tackle, that's where you need to get to. And if you can get them with the ball on their chest, that's when you're on. So th- that's the decision-making we coach is if you can get to a point, you can get there early in good position, you can keep that ball on someone's chest so they can't long place, mm-hmm. then that's a jackal opportunity. Then the techniques around that is uh, you dig like a dog digging in the sand, you know, just get furious on keeping the ball on the chest and, twisting and turning and getting that ball up. Mm-hmm. If you're not there in time and the ball's out, the instinctive thing needs to be, you're not going to be able to steal that easily. That That's where you need to take the space or, or take out a target. Um, getting those decisions automatic so people don't have to think. They know, oh, I've trapped it here. That's a jackal. Or I haven't trapped it there. That's a take space or reset in the defensive line. Getting those decisions make uh, is, is sort of sort of the key. That's where you can get everyone good, yeah. um, just on those decisions. And so players will go, "Oh, I haven't made it defense," or "Oh, yes, that's jackal." Yeah. And then the best players will get the jackal. The the, the not so good players might get a penalty. They might um, just do enough to slow it down. Hundred percent. And with kicking, there's off often trends. Say, for, say for instance, in the women's game, we, we're trying to de- develop more power and extension behind the kick and the and the drawback, like the golf swing, when you're drawing the club back. We're trying to create more energy and power there. Um, is there anything that's common that's restricting jacklers' hip mobility, flexibility, that that type of thing? That's a, a trend you're seeing. 
Um, I, I, I think um, this is the concept I enjoy, Brenny, is that um, a, a jackal is actually a really dynamic uh, activity. There's a lot of small incremental movements in there. Um, you often see big boys just simply dump over and just stay like, you know, like feet in concrete, oh, I'm not moving. And if you're 150 kilos, that's fine. You're probably going to get away with it. But for most people to simply just stand there and be a target and just see if you can weather it, like a bull, two bulls sort of colliding, one's just yeah. standing there, one's getting... <laughs> For me, that's that's something which a lot of people think is just shut eyes and just stay. But the, <laughs> I think is uh, is kind of the small little movements you can do to shrug incoming collisions off. Um, small adjustments of the feet, small adjustments of the shoulders and back and arms can do wonders. Uh, I, I like this analogy where Ooh, yeah. your feet are like. Uh, in Japan, they build houses on sort of small shingle and rocks and stones. So when the earthquakes come, the house the houses move. They have a bit of a give. They're actually able to weather it. And it's kind of the same when you're in that vulnerable position where you're bent over. Someone's going to collide with you, like give you a real big knock. If you haven't got the ability just to move and have that little bit of yeah. core, that little bit of dynamic to absorb and shrug off, impacts you can actually stay in there longer if your foundation you're building is like there's no give when the quake comes the building simply cracks and topples yeah and same when you get hit in a rock like if you're just anchored and you're not 150 kilos bang you get blown out if you've got a little bit of give and you can twist that guy might shoot over the top or twist around yeah. the corner or enter into a different sort of clean out oh, that's where there's a lot of that's the art to to jackling i believe is the the small movements you can do mm. in those very dark horrible places <laughs> <laughs> mate that's a great example and i think you've explained exactly why i wanted to ask you about tackle and jackal because you've already given us a bit of gold and just some mindset and, and tips for players so 2008, a couple of concussions happened in your own in playing days, which was sort of forced you to get a, get into coaching. And was it, am I right in saying your first coaching gig was at Leinster Tigers? Yeah, Leicester. Yeah, Leicester Tigers. Yeah, Leicester. Um, was yeah privileged enough to stay on as a coach. It was skills coach and um, contact, so breakdowns and tackle areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Um, and I suppose where I'm going with this is this gave you the first opportunity to learn about assistant coaching in throughout your career. Now you've had both a head coach role and also assistant coach roles. So I guess looking back on, on what you've done now, what are some of uh, the key learnings you've had and can kind of speak about being an assistant coach and then getting into head coach role? So massive question. Take it however you like. <laughs> <laughs> Just so out of there, bigger, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, look, in, in terms of me, what I was privileged with um, starting in a place like Leicester, in the, it was the sort of golden era of Leicester where um, the, the squad was phenomenal. There was more internationals in the B team than, than most A teams. Uh, so the, the clientele was just incredible. We were winning a lot. Wow. Um, what, what it gave me is, is a new coach who hadn't, I hadn't done much, uh, it thought much about coaching before. I'd sort of coached age group teams and I always enjoyed it, but I never thought seriously about it. But having the access to delve into players of that caliber and, and understand techniques and mindsets and things like that was a, uh, an amazing start for me. So I, I gathered a lot out of it and, and, for the couple of years that I was there doing that, it was it was awesome. Um, and I think uh, my biggest learning as an assistant coach is uh, versus a head coach is that the head coach is a bit more big picture. It looks after the bigger whole, the culture and environment, and and pretty much lays the foundation for the assistants to be able to go well, yeah. um, create an environment where assistants can um, plug in all the detail, all the um, all, all the, the micro stuff which players enjoy and and for me that's the the kind of the bigger difference I, I definitely prefer the head coach and looking after the bigger picture ensuring mm -hmm. there's an environment where the, the the people that love the detail that are 
that enjoy that that side of things can really flourish. And I would say, based of, off what we just spoke about, you're a guy who loves the detail, though. Uh, I love the detail in certain areas, Brenny. Certainly, the individual tackle, tech, the the context, the collisions. Uh, I love I love that stuff. I love the detail of that. Um, but I've I, I, pref- I more enjoy cre- creating, uh, helping with the environment, um, making sure people are confident in what they do, that players turn up wanting to get better, that, um, that there's a mood as such where uh, people are accountable, responsible, and to get out in the field, you know, intrinsically motivated to, to do as best they can. That's what I enjoy more. I, I do enjoy the the smaller detail, mate. But my knees and body don't hold up to doing the <laughs> demos anymore, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, and, so that's and probably sp- the, the big difference. I suppose as a as a head coach, do you sort of build that into your your week to get your fix of the hands on coaching along with the the big picture stuff that you really love? Yeah, I've, I've had this philosophy. Um, I, that I grew first time that I came to Japan about 10 years ago is I really enjoy when I just, whenever I need a sort of, uh, a sort of a, a detail fix, I just laser in on or narrow my focus down to one or two guys that, that need it. And I just say, right, this, this guy or these two guys are my guys for the next two weeks. I'm just working on this aspect of them mm. and putting all the detail into just the one or two guys for a couple of, for a week or two or three. Yeah. And, and for me, that's that, that's a really that's big bang for your buck because they feel yeah. the love. So big picture, they get confidence because the coach is giving them a lot of one on one. But the growth that you see when you're giving that sort of one on one is 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 really cool. And I've noticed when you start doing that, those guys and, and girls grow really quickly. But then the team sees that, and then there's sort of like a mirror, and there's a lot of copying, and then people tag up with those individuals and it, it sort of spreads this yeah. this positive feel and it's not always well in fact very rarely it's the best players it's it's the guys at the time that i feel like i can connect with that that person there's something there that he's struggling with confidence over this aspect if i just you know 10 minutes after every session for the next three weeks just focus on that guy with this pro with this problem and these solutions we're going to see some massive growth in him him or her yeah, and it'll flow onto the team. I, I love that. So you had an experience there where you were coaching some seriously good players and, t- and talented players, and then you had the opportunity to go to, to Canada. I'm pretty sure and coach some of the the female players there and work with them. Uh, for your coaching, I'm sure you found that hugely beneficial. Yeah, do you, like coaching. So. Brainy, I, I I love um, so when I started this and got hooked on coaching and, and just thought it was a just a beautiful profession. I um, I had this concept that I didn't want to stay in an environment for longer than two years for the first ten years of my coaching. That was I, I talked about it with my wife and said I I want to I want to go as best I can as a coach. I want to learn the art of coaching. I want to be a a good coach, not a good regurgitator of of structures and systems that people do. I actually want to be able to, mm. like we talked about at Revolution Rugby, grow the art of coaching, the soft skills of rugby. So I, I had this theory and that 10 years I'd go hard and at the end of 10 years I'd see where I'd got to and I had my certain goals I wanted to hit in terms of the type of teams I've coached. Um, but so two years at a place, then I felt like in order to um, advance as a coach, I had to keep changing, change my culture. Um, so I went to Japan after Leicester. Then I went, as you say, to Canada and coached the, the women's national team there. And then to New Zealand, the coaching super team there, uh, head coaching with the tag. So all these different two-year blocks. Mm. Um, and the, the thing I really enjoyed about all of those was it just threw me into a whole new thing. And I had to get, just couldn't coach the system which had worked at Leicester or other teams I'd been with because it just didn't work. I got found out and exposed. And I realized pretty quick that just because it worked there, it's not going to work everywhere. Um, and it, that was just, you know, our system which worked for those people. So when I went to Japan, all that stuff that I thought was, you know, your gold standard stuff was, mm. it didn't, 
didn't bear any weighting. Some of it was good, some of it was relevant, but a lot of it was didn't work at all. So certainly Japan exposed that for me in that um, the culture difference there, the way people learn, the way people get motivated was hugely different. And the way I'd learned at Leicester, yeah, I had to rethink everything I did and the way I approached it. And that was highlighted even more and hence why I went to a national women's program, which was good, was, you know, that's another whole shift in your coaching. When you're coaching professional men at a super high level, then you coach Japanese semi-professionals and then you mm. coach women. The the difference in personnel, not just playing-wise and, uh, you know, the way they think, educated, um, gender differences, which there are a lot, it was it was incredible for my, um, I guess, empathy, coaching empathy, and and understanding what drives different people and how I would have to handle myself as a coach mm. uh, grew me immensely, and it, it certainly added to my coaching toolbox. Um, the biggest ones, Brainy, I'm sure you appreciate this, is uh, and with with uh, coaching ladies is the the the, why, the questions of why. <laughs> yeah. I um, I just. It used to blow my mind. I, I, we make a video online about um, that one session. I just did a warm-up drill and one of the ladies asked why and I couldn't a- answer. I, and I just got home and I just realized it was because that was the drill that I'd always warmed up with. And I just, and this lady hadn't warmed up with it and she asked why. And she kept asking me, why are we doing this? And I just thought it was a great process for me is what, why are you doing stuff? And so reassess, always ask why. And the ladies taught me that. And I yeah. think uh, uh, that some of my best coaching growth came from that uh, that couple of years in Canada. You said you had your your ten year plan, two years at a spot. What's the, what's the plan now? <laughs> <laughs> Three to five years. Yeah. Um, so when you do two years at a spot, you you certainly get really good at uh, understanding what's in front of you. And was that to... sorry, sorry to cut you off. Yeah, I know. I know that you come in with a lot of energy to an environment. Was that two year like just a, a brick wall? There was no. I wasn't doing a third year in your head. It was just I'm doing two years and I'm out. Yeah, yeah, my head. It was. It was. Let's do two years. So my wife, who's awesome, I've been mean, hugely um, supportive of us traveling around, having four kids on the yeah, road, wow. gy- gypsy lifestyle. So we said, look, we can do it for we can do it for ten years. By then, we'll have, the kids will be done, and we'll probably be looking at having to pick a place for cool. sort of the latter years of high school. She, she was awesome around that. So we said, yeah, let's have an experience. Let's. Let's have the kids born in different continents. Let's let's <laughs> let's try that, and it pretty it's grown us as a family. Amazing, actually. Yeah. Um, but so yes, it was. So it was always two years, and then unless you know circumstance said otherwise, we would be looking to move on. Um, and that, that was a planned aspect, and we we're with that in mind, we were able to take opportunities which a lot of people may not have because mm. we were so flexible to move. And so when good opportunities came my way, able to coach super and international teams, I could say yes and yeah. confidently say yes and go, yep, and pull trigger. Yeah. Um, the downside is after that 10 years, the reflection is sort of the sweet spot of coaching is that three to five year mark, I believe. Like we do so much in two years, we get it to a point where I'm really looking forward to seeing where some of these players go, some of the things we've put in place yeah. blossom. But because you leave, you don't see it and you don't follow it and you don't, yeah, I guess you don't get the fruit, fruit of your reward. Um, so the plan from now it was always let's reassess in 10 years, which has just passed. And now we're, now I'm wanting to see, you know, the, the three to five year plan, like how the two years of, you know, putting stuff in, you know, seeing it, seeing it through to fruition, seeing these young men, men who we grow over two years or women. Mm-hmm. how they develop in their sort of yeah in their beautiful phase which is that three to five years with you and yeah, that, yeah. that's what i'm really interested to see now is is that that period so we're making decisions with a with a little bit longer mindset install love it um before we get into revolution rugby you've got a a lot of learnings so you just explained there about all the different environments you've coached in 
are these learnings getting stored in a journal, a Google Doc, a Dropbox, a Notes folder? Like, how, how, <laughs> how do you document all this stuff in the brain? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm I'm not a massive paperwork guy, Brenny, but chatting chatting to guys like you, uh, it, it really causes me to reflect a lot. I, I enjoy these sort of conversations because it just uh, it gets me ticking around, it gets me thinking again, but. I do write a lot, so we've um, so this revolution rugby um, mentoring we're doing. It's we, we've videoed it. We've videoed a lot of the big concepts, and we've actually written. I uh, got Paul Phillips, who's a very good writer, to to write these, and we're we're putting this on paper in a book. So mm. he's essentially documenting it for me. I make the videos, then he he documents into book form. And at the moment, there's 50 chapters in that, and that's probably a book in itself but as we go we'll probably get that to about 100 100 chapters or so just short sharp concise lessons um but uh, for me it's uh it's largely in the head until i get my ass into gear and get it down on paper yeah and i think so to, just to sort of give the overview for this um a couple of weeks ago, I know that you've, you've put the website together and you asked me to check it out and have a look and, and have a look through. And firstly, hugely impressed with the content. And I think that's what's really cool when it comes through is that there's a lot of thought and learning and mistakes being made for you to have these sort of types of videos and present the way that you are. So that was really cool to see. So I found myself watching the videos, not just to give feedback, to, but to actually learn things myself. So well done on that. Um, but, and I want to get into it now. So you've sort of divided the website up into to four areas. So process, culture, structure, and leadership. And it's, it's talking about the, the soft skills of rugby coaching. So not the, the tackle and the jackal line out scrum it's all the things that uh, are probably more off field and, and rugby so you've answered a lot but uh, I'm going to ask the question why did you start revolution rugby why did you organize all this information yeah th thanks Brenny. uh yeah um originally well coaching I guess is a is a relatively isolated profession um, a lot of coaches that we've talked to operate on their own. Um, they train after 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 schools, after work, that kind of thing. There's not there's not a lot out there that actually helps you deal with some of the stresses and the, the real issues of rugby. There's there's loads out there in terms of drills and skills, but the biggest issue I've had over the last um, 13, 14 years professional coaching is the learnings I get of how to interact with the team um and, and where do i get better at that side of things like i always know i can go onto like the rugby side or other sites and, and get drills i can i can talk to other people about the drills and skills but there's there was never anything out there in terms of getting you know what do i do with how do i deal with stresses what are the how do i soften stresses how do i um get better with developing team um mm. the culture how do you how do you develop culture like, and, and I was lucky that mixing in a professional circle, uh, the top professional coaches are, are very open. And, and we, I, I'm lucky that I can talk to these people regularly on a regular basis and, and pick people's brain, not around the detail of X's and O's of jackals and tackles and structures, but, you know, how do you discipline a player without losing the team? How do you win the trust of the change room? How do you develop your leaders so that they take more ownership? How do you get a culture where the players are accountable? But those type of questions, um, mm. which is something which top-end professional rugby strive for because th th those areas are what defines great teams from mediocre teams. But th th those things are not confined to top professional teams. They, they flood every level of rugby from under nines to high school to university to ivy league schools to sevens to to women's everything it's the better leadership and culture you have um the, the better it is to, to grow your skills in itself the better the players are driving the team the less stresses are, are you on as coach and the more i got into that me and paul galland who set up revolution rugby we started together at, at otago rugby he was high performance i was the head coach and we 
we set out that we wanted to um, to grow this aspect, grow our players as leaders, to develop a good culture. And we, we'd basically just set up our own systems and just use it as an experiment to trial and error and see what worked, what didn't. I had some fantastic mentors myself that I would check in regularly with and, 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 and go back and forth with the pros and cons and have sympathetic ears that would listen to the failures as much as the successes. And there was no, when I talked to other coaches, most coaches that aren't at the high level, high end professional don't have access to anything on this. Like the, your level one, two, three coaching courses, it doesn't even, it doesn't even scratch the surface of how to develop the art of coaching. It's simply around here's a line out structure or here's a tackle technique. Here's the checklist for doing a tackle well, which is all good stuff, but it's, it's not, um, it's not the biggest bang for your buck where I don't feel like once you've got the basics, that's fine. Then how do you get the players driving that? How do you get them to do it? So it's taking some pressure off you as the coach. So that, that those sort of concepts, and there was nothing out there online that answered those questions for us. So we thought, well, right, let's, let's put our learnings into this and let's, let's do it. Let's do it ourselves. Let's be some, a, a resource tool that coaches particularly can come to and, and develop the art of the soft skill, the, yeah. the bits which, and we believe those grow your soft skills as a coach, as the art of coaching. And that that's the foundation. And your skills and drills are the bits which that foundation is, is going to lead towards. Mm. So your leadership, your culture, uh, those are your big rocks. If, if you get a great culture, <laughs> you know, it takes, uh, the rest of it can take care of itself if, if done well. Yeah. And I think you just answered my my question i was going to ask if, if someone says to you ben like this is all just bullshit and butterflies all this stuff what would be your message to that person about why this stuff is so important and is that the foundation yeah well and yes it's definitely some and the interesting thing this is the way things are going anyway there's a there's a, there's a you can feel a shift happening from the old school way of coaching the dictator up front saying this is the way to go do it and don't get me wrong, that, that has its place. Um, and, and, and that needs to be done at times. At the buck stops with the head coach, for example, and at times that is a very effective, good way of doing it. But modern rugby audiences aren't used to that as much. So if you're coaching mm. in the old school way, you're now coaching uh, a new age person, a new society, a new generation has changed. They, they change every year. There's new ways of doing things. If you stay in the old, you're not, maximizing your effect yeah. so you've got a mold to what's coming through you, you certainly keep aspects of that um but you know mold to the new to be more effective um in terms of the butterfly uh in terms of the eerie fairy oh this is all nicely stuff <laughs> I, I just i just um I, I like to think of it like this like coaching can be stressful like it is a stressful thing and when you're dumping it all, all on yourself as a coach, you can burn out pretty quick. I, I've burnt out, certainly in the beginning, where I tried to control everything mm. um, and just said, I'm running it, let me do it. Josh, the, the stress that I took home, I took out on, you know, like it, it flowed through to my, I'd get home and it all, work would come with me. It would, my, I'd talk to my wife and it would come out and her, it'd come out the kids. And then I realized that the players at the level I was coaching know as much more than me and certainly in the individual areas they know way more than me why aren't i using their skills their expertise to help grow us all and the moment where i got rid of my ego and that um that coaching ego and said right let's let's go together and let's get people driving their little areas and i'm just becoming the facilitator of yeah. them excelling I just the stress levels went down unbelievably and what we did was so much better because players felt accountable and the culture was that if you knew your stuff the expectation was we want you to deliver that stuff because you you know it um, if I try to keep it said no you don't deliver I'm the coach I deliver <laughs> mm. for example then all that stress comes back on me if it, if it fails I feel the stress I feel the pressure from everyone but when players have the responsibility accountability to deliver for example a certain yeah. aspect then they get together and they go man we don't want this to fail we, we need to get yeah and then there's peer pressure then there's social responsibility then there's leadership requirements which 
they have expectations of. And then the standard lifts. So the standard lifts and the pressure comes off. And for me, that's when, uh, that, that's, you know, that, that's where the advantage is. If you try hold it in and be that, you know, I'll decide I'll run the ship the whole time. Yeah. It just, it, that's what, um, you lose the fun and you lose the fact that it's still a game. Yep. Really well explained by a guy who's been through it. It's really good. Um, <laughs> so I want to go into the, the four areas and just touch on one point from, from the website. So the four areas, again, leadership, structure, culture, process. First one, leadership. So there's a couple of awesome videos, and I'll read a couple of titles just so people get a feel for, for what Revolution Rugby is. So leadership, um, values make it easy, save your bullets, positivity as a base. Those are three different videos on the website. Um, and one of them is, does your personality affect the team? So my question for you is, is does your personality affect the team? What do you reckon? <laughs> yeah. I watched the video this morning, so I know the answer, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. keen for you to t- touch yeah. on it. Oh, I, I think so. I, I don't think there's any hiding from the fact that um, whether you like it or not, as coach, particularly head coach, and you might be the only coach in whatever level you're coaching, you are a leader. You are probably the first leader um, of that group, and you set the tone. And your personality does set the tone um, of, of whichever way that goes. Um, let's just take those classics. If you're a dictator, that's your personality. You're going to set a, a tone and environment, which is going to be a dictatorship and yeah. a hierarchy down the order. And that's going to flow through the team, whether it's conscious or not. Uh, people are going to understand that's the system. And it's going to be, you're there, players, there, there, there. If you're democratic, that all that stuff, it's going to flow on. And, and, it's just going to inherently flow. So, whatever you your personality is, it's going to it's going to go on to the team. Um, whatever approach you take is going to is going to be reflected. You're the first leader. Your your tone, your behaviour, it, it, it's sort of it's downward traffic. And I think it's important to remember that um, as a leader. Um, I, I take I take a approach which is um, as much as I can. I try lose as much ego as I can um, mm. around that leadership. I think ego's uh, a massive word for coaching. Um, I think coaching inherently uh, attracts potentially people you know, with a little bit of ego and it can certainly consume you um, in a leadership role that you feel like you want to succeed. Of course you want to succeed. And if you don't, you take it personally and that's a personal affront to yourself. Um, so with leadership, I think the more you can release uh, the demons that ego bring out, uh, the, the better it is. And me personally, I, I, I'm one of my key learnings from uh, like the, the leadership style of things and my personality was, I remember that I was coaching um, the Canadian Sevens team and we, we played the American Sevens team. That's a big rival when we lost. And I remember I was really down about it because it was a big rivalry and i remember i walked upstairs in the grandstand and it sort of barged past the, um, a lady that was trying to keep people out of the coffee area and, I, and for me i remember thinking after reflecting on that that was a really that's not my personality but i'd i'd been absorbed by the ego of winning of this coaching thing that i'd become someone else and my personality had changed and then when I reflect on it, I was like, right, if, if this is what I'm showing to the public, to the team, mm. that's then acceptable that if we lose or perform, I, I can behave in whatever manner I want. Mm. And that's essentially the example I'm setting for the players. If we lose or things don't go right, whatever way you behave is acceptable. And that's not right for the players. Um, that's I don't want that. I want resilient. I want strength of character. I want, um, you know, strength in the face of adversity. All those, you know, glory words, I suppose. But I wasn't necessarily reflecting it myself to begin with. And I think if if that's what the leader, me, the coach brings, I need to mm. check myself and before I can critique anyone else about the way they behave. 
I, I rate there what you're saying about ego, and I'm keen to just dig a little bit deeper on it. So as a player, you often want a, a player to be confident and have a bit about them and, and you know, almost have a bit of a strut and a confidence way they are, are on the field. Um, I'd imagine as a coach, you, ne- you never want to give off the vibe that you're not confident in, in what you're delivering or the, or the environment that you're in. And also the second part to this is, if you're desperate to get to the next level as a coach or a player, often it comes across that you're desperate. Um, how can you go about that a better way? Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, the ego is a, a fascinating one, isn't it? So I like the, the first, the second part of the question is how do, how do you give off that? That desperate stuff is, is tough i guess that the, the first part of that question is around like how do we you know check our ego and, and just keep it at bay and i think the, my biggest analogy which when i when i had this sort of aha moment is is being able to separate success and what that actually looks like and i talk about this in the videos around what the difference is between public and private success so publicly as a professional coach um I'm defined by results. That's what the public's going to see, trophies, titles, banners, all that stuff. And from a public perspective, fair enough. And, and that's just what it is. And I, professional coach, understand that. I've got a weather enough skin to realize externally that's what people are looking at. Yeah. But privately, what success looks like is very different. Success for me is my philosophy, which is um, to, to help grow great people. That's my base, to grow leaders, to help a culture. And that's what keeps me on track. So that's my coaching philosophy is my private successes. And, and that keeps the ego a little bit at bay and it's, it keeps it on the, the straight. When your ego is attached to the public success, it can go up and down based on results and whatever yeah. may be happening in the public eye, particularly from a professional point of view. We lose, you know, everything was bad. My ego's taken a hit. I'm going to take it out on players. Um, mm. It's unacceptable. And I go down that route. But, you know, you can't always control that because, you know, you might have 15 injuries or you might have you know, <laughs> COVID-related uh, absences and things like that. And, and just a circumstance which you can't always control. But if you have um, a default area where you come back to your private success, mm. you know, like how have I been able to grow this culture? Am I growing this culture? Am I developing leaders? Um, and it, you've got small wins amongst that. Like um, I, I tell stories about like one, one guy just becoming a better public speaker, more confident talking in front of the team. And I remember the day where I just went, yes, he's up there. He spoke for two minutes. It was beautiful. It was perfect. He had a, you know, in front of the team, which he didn't do at the start, private success. So yeah. that keeps you on track as a coach. And I think that separation is really important because if we're just wound up in the public success, we're all over the show and the stresses can overwhelm. If you stick to this, your philosophy, whatever that may be, and your, your private successes, it keeps you more grounded, keeps you um, in control of your ego better. Yeah. And I think that's important. Um, in terms of the second part of that question, Brenny, around um, being desperate. Were I, you I desperate think, at any stage? Do you think that you were ever had that or because you got straight into coaching at a good level, you kind of we're really happy with how it's going. Uh, I certainly early on when I wasn't able to separate out the private success, when I was, when I was defining myself based on results, when I was comparing myself to others based on results of the team, Hmm. that's when I wasn't this, like I wouldn't say desperate's the right word, but I was, I was feeling it like the team was doing average. That meant I was an average coach and that's not, you know, it's not helping me. And then, then you start judging yourself and you start beating yourself up and you start taking that out on players. And then your personality changes in the team environment because you're hung up on, you know, results, which, you know, it isn't always, you know, can't always, some of the best coaches I know are coaches, which are coaching some of the worst teams Um, because they're actually having to coach the team because there's so much to coach and they're actually doing great jobs and it's incremental advancements. Um, just because your team's winning, it doesn't define you as a coach. On CV, it may be wonderful and it may help get jobs and things, but 
yeah. if your private successes is your your growth as a coach, your ability to get through to players and things, that that's what keeps you settled, content, and it keeps you getting, you know, getting better and better yourself. Yeah, mate. There's so many different avenues I can go down here. It's great, uh, but I really enjoy <laughs> like um, private and, and public. It's um, the first guy I thought about straight away was Eddie Jones when I'm thinking about what he's going through with England at the moment. Probably a good example of. If he's gone off what, how the public are feeling, he's probably mm. going to lo- lose lose the pot. Um, next one, structure. Mm. Um, so again, a couple of videos hit hit the ground running. Um, iceberg model, which I uh, I found really uh, a great video. But then one of the videos, players presenting, and I think this is one that I've um, thought about a lot within teams. Players presenting, how they go about it, the different ways of presenting. Um, you've obviously found that it's hugely beneficial to have players presenting. Yeah, I think I, I, I really do. A um, couple of reasons. Uh, I think first, first it creates uh, responsibility from a player's point of view. When you, even if um, you're getting up in front of your team and you're presenting something and that, that's a, for a lot, for some, for a lot of people, that's quite a big public speaking is a, is a pressure situation. It's a nervous situation. So massive. Yeah. We want we want our players for a bigger picture, our men and women. We want them to be. That's a good life skill to have. To have confidence to be able to stand in front of a group and say what you believe in. That's that's a big picture concept. Um, if we can practice that concept in our use, using the vehicle of rugby, that players can get better at getting up and speaking um, in front of their peers about something they believe in, know about. That's massive. That's 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 huge life skill we can be teaching. Um, rugby environments are great because people can, can always have confidence about what they talk about. As long as you, the coach, frame it in a way which they can have confidence and you give them, you make it easy for them. So it can be as simple as just getting some some players to talk about things that they know about. Like you might, um, for example, get your halfback to talk about what he or she wants uh, communication-wise from the people catching the ball. And you preempt them by saying, "Look, we're we're getting uh, there's a disconnection between uh, our halfback passing and our forward runners. So before this meeting, can you just get up and talk about what you want mm. your forwards to be saying?" And then that, that halfback has, uh, in effect, confidence to say because he or she knows what they want, yeah. and then they get up and say it. So they're not wrong. They're not going to make any mistakes because it's just an opinion. This is what I want, yeah. and they get up and they say it, and they they can be relatively confident that that's what they want and you the coach have given them permission to say it and you preempt it by saying Steve or Sally's going to just talk about what they want and you do that enough times and gradually it becomes normal and they're confident and it's great so that's getting players presenting and and the more confident people you can talk about um, (laughs) your teams can talk about what the game plan is going to be that week your leaders can talk about your mindsets um, if, if things happen off field, you might have sort of social people that can make calls in front of the team around, right, after the game, we're going to do this, or this incident happened after the game last week. This is how we need to approach it. And, and you can, the more you can do as a coach to have little conversations before the fact, so you're not just throwing someone up there uh, off the cuff because, you know, um, what do you call that? Um, impromptu speaking is a, probably the hardest form of public speaking. So you don't want to impromptu it. You want to you know, make it easy for people. So to even start with, some of that stuff can be very scripted. Here's mm. what I think you should say. Say that. Mm. Are you happy to say that? Yeah, I'm happy to say that. Okay, just say that. And then it's confidence because you they're just a mouthpiece. Um, yeah. And as they get more confident and more you know, reassured in the environment, they'll start taking that wherever they want to take it. I think the second thing Brainy it does is it just takes away the monotony of one coach's voice. Um, I, I like the, that concept that your word and your tone matters. Like if you're a um, dictator, for example, and you want to have power, if you're constantly shouting and making noise, it can come a little bit of white noise. Um like and I, I mentioned this around parenting is if you're constantly yelling at the kids, um, they just don't listen after a while. And when dad yells, it's like, oh, whatever, dad. 
um, and they don't pay any attention. And it's the same with uh, players. If you're constantly their voice, uh, when you go to that voice, it doesn't have as much impact. And, and I want, when I go to angry dad, angry coach voice, which I don't do very often, but when I do, I want it to be have impact and to actually yeah. get instant results. Um, if my two-year-old's running towards the road and he's constantly used to me yelling and I yell for him to stop and he thinks it's just another one of dad's things and keeps going, that's when we're in trouble. But yeah. if if I yell stop in a certain voice, I want him to go, whoa, I need to listen to this. And so <laughs> by getting um, other players to talk, it, um, it, it makes when you talk have more impact. And then when you talk, you want to have impact. And... The more you can delegate, I think it it, it adds weight to your own words. Mm. I, and going back to that simple example of the halfback just getting up and, and delivering a message on what um, he or she wants from a receiver, and then they go and train it, you see it, the ownership starts to, to happen. And I think contribution is we can never underestimate contributing to any environment, any conversation, sitting around a table, literally having a voice okay, cool, I'm contributing and I, and I feel bloody good about I'm, I'm a part of this. So I, I really rate it. And it doesn't have to be a massive presentation. Something as simple as what you just said is, is key. Um, mm. Culture, a massive word that gets thrown around a lot. So uh, again, a couple of the videos, culture is king, win, win the change room. Is there a reason why it's win the change room, not win the changing room? I was wondering on your website. That's probably just a grammatical typo there from <laughs> I thought there might be a unique <laughs> reason for it. Um, no. so in the, win the change room um, and something bigger than yourself so I want to ask you about you're heading into a new environment you've done your two year stint like you did you've gone to this brand new team um, you may not have been allowed to sit in on anything. You're literally turning up to coach this new team. What are some important things that I uh, that you think are, are good to do maybe in your very first week of, of getting on field with, with a team when it comes to culture? Oh, I think the biggest one that my, my learning around in that example, Rainy, around you, you're in a new environment, first week in the on the job. Um, I think the, the best thing you can do is actually um, as simple as the sounds, but you can learn everyone's name off by heart. Um, there's something about um, what that does to you. I had a coach do it to me um, that came into our environment and he knew everyone's name before he got there. And I remember the first time, I, I, I'd, I'd never met him before. And um, oh. when we passed, he goes, oh, hey, Ben, how you doing? How's And he knew a couple of, little tidbits about me, which he'd obviously, in hindsight, he'd obviously Googled every player, got a couple of little bits <laughs> or talked to people and got a couple of little things to talk about. Oh, how's, I heard you, you and your wife have moved here from there. And I was like, oh, well, wow. oh. And I remember feeling when he said that, now after the conversation walked away, I actually felt, I'm into this. This guy's got something. <laughs> and I remember, <laughs> I, I remember the, 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 the feel. And then when I reflected on it, he would have done that to everybody. And then it just creates this aura, this sort of collective feel where we're, we're starting to buy into whatever this coach is bringing. Like before he did, he'd said a word about rugby, he had me. Um, he was, I was like, I'm, I'm listening to this guy. What's this guy got to say? I'm intrigued. I'm excited about this guy. And all it was was because he made this little connection, which sounds odd. He knew just a, a little obscure thing about me. And it, maybe it was because he should, he'd done a, um, he cared a little bit, cared enough about this team that he'd taken the time to mm. learn my name. And I just, so that's something that I've taken on to all these moves is in the first week, wow. I want to know by the end of it, everyone's name. And in Japan is a, a, a really good example of that because I've, I struggle with the pronunciation of a few of the names, um, just as you can imagine. So I'm, mm. And it's very hard to actually Google all the squad you just can't do it. it can't be done so i make a point now that the first i don't start officially i come in a few days and i just stand with a translator on the sidelines and just say this guy and i make little word associations oh that guy is and, and i understand so when i do hit the ground running i know everyone's name mm. and I, when i walk past them i can hey and i can and then they're like oh oh this that feels good no one's yeah yeah this guy's talking my name and so 100%. It starts things the right way. It starts the culture in the way that you want it 
to roll. I take that a little bit further too around, and I think um, a, a number of teams do this, is just those small connections. This is in a professional environment, but you can obviously tone it back to any sort of environment. The first thing you do is connect with people to create a culture of we're together, we're, we're one, we're a group. So you know, you're know, you shaking hands or your fifth pumps or just acknowledging people with a mm. name or whatever. Brainy, good morning, mate. You're in, that little connection. And then you feel, oh, great. I'm, I'm looking forward to this, whatever's happening from here. And once, if the leader's doing that without fail every time they meet, it spreads, like that's what culture is. It's a spreading of, you know, a, a culture. It's the, the growth of something. And, you know, in biology, it's that, like a yogurt, like a fermented product that feeds mm. on itself. If a coach is constantly fist pumping people, saying, how you doing, mate? How's your day? How's the kids? Work? Then the players start doing that amongst themselves. Um, the players are looking for handshakes. When someone new comes into the environment, people are up high five introducing, asking them questions mm. because it's something which has been instilled in the environment. That feeds through to better communications, better chat, more accountability. All those buzzwords flow yeah. on from that. I, I I noticed in your answer you didn't say get in a room, get into groups, and write down on a page of paper all the buzzwords and then put them on a whiteboard, which uh, as you as you <laughs> as you, you may have done before. Um, where are you at with that? Where are you at with uh, those those generic culture sessions? They're even called a culture session. Yeah. Um, um, where are you at with that? Yeah. I, I, I never particularly enjoyed going through them is when I was on the other side of those. And I think Agreed. talking to a few good friends of mine who are in education circles as teachers and principals and things, that's very much the rage in those, those sort of things is, you know, that sort of discussion groups. But um, I, I feel like it's, I know I switch off on those and I feel like um, I'm not a big fan. Some people it, it can be good for. Uh, I won't knock it as a as a process. It can be right. I think it's um, it feels a little bit false and and, and feels a little bit airy fairy, as you said it before. That sort of not airy fairy, but that um, lardy dari kind of it's happy feelings kind of stuff without mm. any real meat on its bones. And and I feel like sometimes you walk away from those, and they're just words on a board or words on a chart. And if you don't do anything more, they're there's there's no guts to them. If you if you do that, that can be great. But you've got to then take those and run with them, and actually stand by them as your values. If you put in words on the board, this is how we want to be as a team. This is what our we're on our culture. That essentially becomes your your creed or your motto or your mission statement. And you as the leader have got to use those on a regular basis as your basis for everything. If the, if if those sessions have produced answers such as honesty or vulnerability whatever you're then empowered and entrusted to make sure those are at the forefront of everything you do and that's very hard a lot of the times to do and so they end up it feels like some of those word charts just sort of sit on the wall and just become yeah. words and, and no one lives by them no one stands by them no one drives them um and they're just a little bit fake so the danger is if you do those they're almost hypocritical yeah. Hypocrisy. Yeah. Um, anyway. And I think you're right. I know. Uh, I want to ask you two more questions. Yeah, you're nailing this podcast, mate. You, you're giving a lot of gold. So keep it up. Um, <laughs> two, 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 two more. <laughs> Thanks, areas. buddy. I've really. But, but I think I think with uh, with culture, and you would have had the experience as well when you get um, PD opportunities to go and, and view places. You're not there for a culture session. You literally watch them for a day, and and then after the day, you go, holy shit, these guys do things really well, um, and you can feel it in the room, almost the atmosphere of the gym session, training session, or whatever. Um, last one of the four. So process. Um, again, some videos coaching as a team, uh, someone else's child, which I found really inter interesting listening to, knowledge versus delivery. Um, and then my absolute favorite one was analyze effort. It's one of the things that um, I I'm massive on, especially as a player myself who 
didn't have that massive amount of X factor, had to work for absolutely everything. I, I could control my effort. And it's probably one thing that um, I really stand by is analyzing effort. So keen to hear more from you uh, about that. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I think, um, I think it's a really important to remember. So I'll just touch on briefly around that. Um, the one, the first one you said about, um, someone else's child like i think it's important that like just in relation to that one before i talk about that effort is that as coaches we're like um i remember um when i married my wife and my father-in-law said um it essentially gave her away to me on the on the aisle but what he was essentially doing was entrusting her to me that i would and and my parents were entrusting uh, me to my wife, vice mm. versa. So that parent, no matter what age, I was 26 when I got married, that um, a 50 year old man was entrusting me with his daughter. And <laughs> th- I thought that concept was kind of cool. And that um, it just, uh, and, and what we did and didn't want to do in any relationship is you don't want to press anybody. You, you want to do the opposite. You want to make someone flourish. And that's essentially what it is with coaching and that parents are entrusting you with their children at whatever age like 50 year old parents are entrusting me with their 26 year old professional players what they don't want is for me to um lose their like have them have self-esteem issues them lose confidence me to oppress them to a state where they aren't great people they want me at whatever age to be uplifting their children and, and making them better people and I think that concept is is forefront in my mind as a as a coach. Is that's what I'm there to do. I have a responsibility of parents at whatever age. I'm coaching for. I'm coaching people forty. We got forty year olds in our team, and I'm. I feel like I'm entrusted to their parents, who are probably seventy, that I'm helping grow this person. So when you talk about analysing effort, uh, that's a big one for me too. I think it's again comes back to that public private. If we analyse. Um, if we consider success as the result, did I make that tackle? No, failure. Or we analyze it privately. Did they do everything? They didn't mean to miss that tackle. Did they put, was the effort there? Was the effort better than last week? Yes, it was. Mm. And then critiquing that side of things. And I think if I just take it down to um, defense, say an individual tackle, not everyone loves tackling. Yeah, so there's a range of spectrum. Some people love it. They, 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 hoe, they hoe in and they can take any sort of criticism around it because they want to get better. Some people just getting up in front of someone, that can be a private success. It could be a confidence issue. If for the last three weeks they've been running away from tackles and then the next week they actually go forward and get in a better position but still miss the tackle, that's the bit we got to be... Um, analyzing because that's the improvement they've gone from running backwards every tackle to actually now running forwards if we were still stuck in the um this public they still miss the tackle not good enough and we we slam people we miss the growth that that person's made and we potentially drive their confidence down and then they say oh what am i even doing this for like i'm going to get slammed whatever Mm -hmm. Uh, but if we can say hey look this is where you were two weeks ago look at this clip you're running backwards here Look at this week. You're actually getting forward. The result's still the same, but we're not worried about the result. Mm. We're we're worried about the process. And your process, you'll come from here to here. That's outstanding. Now the next challenge for you to get you from here to this next jump, which is actually making contact. That's the next one. Not finishing the tackle. We're not worried about that just yet. That's That's the one after. So these are our steps. And like encouraging and reinforcing that if you're going the right way mentally, if your efforts directed in the right way, that's, that's huge for us. And that's confidence. And this is where I feel is part of the art of coaching. Like, and particularly if I just go back to defense, the biggest thing in a tackle is confidence. So the first thing we're coaching when we're coaching tackling and defense is, we want to make people confident. We want, we're want we trying to make them want to tackle. That's the yeah. first thing we have to do because someone doesn't want to tackle, it's going to be a debacle. 
we're trying to coach confidence into people because we're asking them to charge into an incoming bus at times. So you got to have to, you know, that's uh, that's not an easy thing for for some people. So, in most people, most sane people, to charge into an incoming bus is not a thing. So, we want to encourage the effort. You're making that effort to do that. We love that. That's what we want. Keep going. Instill the confidence, the belief, the desire, yeah. um, not just the, the the outcome. Because if someone doesn't want to tackle, can't tackle, and they miss tackles, that'll stay there if you're just rating the the outcome. Yeah, awesome explanation. And the layers behind it as well, as I think is so key. Same with catch pass, you know, to yes. catch, the fuck, catch the fucking ball. Well, that doesn't help if I got, haven't got the skill set to actually catch the ball and do a job. It's the same with the tackle, mate. Make your bloody tackles. It's not yeah, yeah. It's not, not that helpful on, on trying to find my confidence. So awesome example. Um, great, mate. And, and probably just to sort of wrap up this year, Revolution Rugby, like uh, – I suppose for people to find it, the best place to go is to the website. So www.revolution.rugby. Um, you'll see the areas there. You'll see um, Ben's face on screen talking, talking through the videos. And like I said, um, I'm not just saying it. I think for, for coaches, it's such a good resource. And I think uh, one to also have to come, keep coming back to, if you are having a bit of a, a bad time with your team, you can get, go back and, Geez, our culture shit at the moment. I wonder what um what Ben's advice could be to help things get going again. So, well done on putting it together, mate. Thanks, Brainy. Uh, it's been a it's it, it's it's been a great process putting it together. We've really enjoyed it, and uh, we're really enjoying um the um the mentoring we're doing with a lot of coaches at the moment. Just um meeting groups, doing some zooms, regular catch ups with with coaches that just want to. Be, better in that art of coaching stuff which is hard to access so yeah uh, it's great mate and, and we're, we're getting some good results so um it's a it's a pleasure mate and it's it's uh it's something cool so just before we wrap with that um the vision for it it's obviously got to this stage in your mind um what's what's the vision well how it rolls at the moment is um we do a zoom like a lot of groups are coming to us say like regions with a number of coaches and we do one a, a big collective zoom and we then everyone goes away and does the the modules does these videos where we're getting requests to go to now is a, a bespoke mentoring package where we follow coaches weekly fortnightly over the course of a pre-season season through to completion and review stage and so we essentially we mold it to whatever is needed and whatever your requirements are. And it's that sort of that, that some kind of concept around you catch up and you just vent all the things that have gone right and wrong and what do you do and solutions and fixes and just having that someone you can talk to that's going to keep prodding you and pushing you as a coach around the, the soft skills of coaching and developing leadership and team culture. Um, and, offering ideas for your situation. That's where we are get going towards. And particularly in areas where rugby is not, look, areas like America, for example, where the expertise is just so hard to, to access, the, the mm. ge geographical distance. And for us, we love this. We love being mentors, both me and Paul, uh, mentoring coaches along their coaching journey and trying to grow them as better coaches and the art of coaching is where we want to head to. So it's lovely for me and that I, I can be a professional coach here in Japan and have you know, a, a number of coaches which I mentor uh, on a weekly fortnightly basis throughout the course of their season and grow them is, is something I'm passionate about and, and, and look yeah. forward to continuing. Oh, outstanding. Well, I'm sure, um, I suppose if someone listening did want to make contact, are they able to do that through the website? Yeah, if, if anyone is keen to keep uh, to have a chat just jump online there's a yep. revolution rugby info contact and, and there'll be someone there that can can fill you in awesome mate i'll um, make sure that all those links are in the the show notes to the podcast but that's us mate time for for you to grab your afternoon coffee <laughs> i know you've got the, the the day off so enjoy that and um and good luck for the for the rest of the season legend brenny thanks mate you run a great great operation <laughs> Thank you, mate. Talk soon.